Hello, I'm Rosalie Ginevro, Executive Director of the Architectural League, and I am delighted to welcome everyone to the first of two programs with mixed design on the design methodology and frameworks they've developed to understand and create spaces for all bodies, including non-compliant bodies, and how that methodology is helping them and others think about public space in the era of COVID-19. In tonight's program, Joel Sanders and Seb Che will give an overview of Mixed Design's work. And tomorrow at 1 Eastern time, Joel be, will be joined in a roundtable by several mixed collaborators, Kumal Arroyo, Hansel Bauman, and Magda Mostafa, with Mark Suramaki as moderator, to discuss how different perspectives from work with individuals with autism, with individuals who are deaf, with individuals who have limited mobility, among many others, are informing their work. Clearly, we are facing myriad spatial challenges as we try with, to deal with pressing needs from several directions. The imperative to make our public and quasi-public spaces, including schools, libraries, museums, healthcare facilities, as open and inclusive as possible, and the intense pressure to rethink spaces of all kinds to protect the health of the people who use them. Dealing with these challenges is, is both urgently necessary and an incredibly tall order. What makes the work of mixed design so compelling is the thoroughness and thoughtfulness and theorized depth of the methodology that they have developed. Their collaboration with people in other disciplines who use other modes of inquiry and analysis has been critical to evolving their approach. Mixed de design's first project as a think tank and consultancy was stalled which proposed new design approaches to address the need to create safe, sustainable, and inclusive public restrooms for everyone, regardless of ACE, gender, race, religion, and disability, as the team described their goal on their excellent website on the project. The stalled project was instigated by the moral panic, as they write, triggered by court cases seeking to overturn President Obama's Title IX protections guaranteeing trans individuals access to sex segregated public toilets that align with their gender identity. The work they did on that initiative was in collaboration with tra transgender theorist Susan Stryker and legal scholar Terry Kogan. The project evolved into work that considered the needs of all kinds of non-compliant bodies who were not well served by standard public restrooms. The mixed design team clearly involves expert and innovative designers. But what resonates particularly with me and what I think is key to their impact is their capacity and willingness to seek out and work with others whose thinking provokes, informs, and ultimately can confirm the rightness of design decisions. The challenges we face are so multivalent and so complex, so intersectional, that they cannot possibly be adequately tackled by any one discipline acting and thinking alone. They demand collaboration, and that is at the center of what we'll hear about tonight. In addition to his role as the head of mixed design, Joel Sanders is principal of Joel Sanders Architect based in New York City and professor and director of professional studies at the Yale School of Architecture. He's the author of Stud, Architectures of Masculinity, and with the late landscape designer and theorist Diana Balmore of Groundwork Between Landscape and Architecture, yet another example of his instinct for pr productive collaboration. Seb Cha is a designer and activist. They are the Associate Director of Mixed Design and the Project Manager for the initiatives Stalled Mixed Museum and the Neurodiversity Working Group. Seb also works with groups like the Mohawk Valley Collective, the Rikers Education Pro Program, the Architecture Lobby, and the Friends of Gadsden Creek, and, he also, he, and they also produce and perform experimental music and video propaganda. I want to thank Anne Rieselbach, Katerina Flaxman, Nanase Shirakawa, Anne Carlisle, and Sarah Wessler for their work on tonight's event. And I also want to thank the New York State Council on the Arts, which provided substantial support to Stalled and the National Endowment for the Arts, which is supporting mixed designs work on museums. Both NISCA and the NEA, along with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, also support the Architectural League, for which we're very grateful. Just before I turn the program over to Joel and Seb, I want to note that we will be taking questions tonight using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. You can send qu questions anytime during the talk. Over to you now, Seb and Joel. Well, can you hear me? 
I'm gonna thumbs up or Joel, can you hear me? <laughs> I can. You can let me know. Okay, cool. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. Um, does it look good? Wait, wait. Hold on one second. Yeah, take the time. Okay. Good. Cool. Does it look good from our angel? You can see um, I can what see I'm sharing. I cool. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you to the Architectural League for inviting us to speak tonight. Um, really fun to see all the participants. Um, I was going through the list of names and see some friendly names. Um, and I think that's an older version of my bio, but I love that it includes the video propaganda piece. I wish I was doing more of that these days. Um, so the League has been an instrumental supporter of our work at Mixed Design since the early days of the Stalled Initiative. Um, so we're very grateful to be here. Um, with the League and uh, the League's esteemed guests. And my name is Seb Che. I'm the Associate Director of Mixed Design. And my name is Joel Sanders. I'm the Principal of JSA Mixed Design, as Rosalie already said, a professor at Yale School of Architecture. And Seb and I will be co-presenting this talk tonight. And uh, before I begin, I just want to reinforce that all of the work that you're seeing tonight could not have happened literally without the support of the League. Rosalie and Anne were the first people who believed in us, and it was through them that we were able, with them acting as the, as the League acting as the fiscal sponsor, that was the seed money that began this initiative. So thank you very much. And one of the things we're interested in that um, uh, mixed design is combating ageism. So at the risk of aging myself and Rosalie, not only is this lecture part of a, a, a long history of, of, of an association with the League, but also it dates back, dare I say, to the 1980s, the late 1980s, <laughs> when Rosalie and I and a few others were part of a reading group, uh, uh, plotting out what we hope would be a better future for architecture. Okay, good. So JSA Mixed Design is a New York-based studio composed of two overlapping branches. JSA is an architectural studio. We specialize in doing work at universities. So are you moving next? Yeah, good. Uh, as well as art museums, um, as well as residential commissions, houses, urban lofts, and multifamily housing. In 2018, we established a new branch of JSA, Mixed Design. And MIX is a think tank and a design consultancy dedicated to considering the needs of a broad segment of the population that we argue that the discipline of architecture has traditionally overlooked. What, what we refer to as non-compliant bodies, people of different ages, genders, races, and abilities that fall out of the cultural mainstream. Since the 19th century, Architects and designers from, from Vitruvius to Le Corbusier have designed buildings based on dimensions gathered from studying and measuring the characteristics of the so-called normal body. One that is assumed to be white, able-bodied, cisgender, heterosexual, and male. This ergonomic data has been the basis of design standards encoded in the architectural guidelines and regulatory codes that are still in use to this day. However, this supposedly objective scientific data has been used to differentiate normal from abnormal bodies. At different moments in history, including our own, it has been used to justify discriminatory policy, policies determining who has access to and who is excluded from public space, including women, people of color, immigrants, and the disabled, based on the assumption that they possess innate physical, mental, or moral defects that render them unfit to enter the public realm. Mixed design is dedicated to combating this legacy of exclusion in architecture. We work with progressive clients to apply our unique inclusive design approach to develop toolkits, guidelines, and prototypes for making everyday building types like workplaces, campuses, and museums 
safe and accessible for a wide spectrum of people with different identities and embodiments. And our work is based on a series of design principles which build upon but differentiate, but differentiate itself from the important foundation laid by the ADA, whose 30th anniversary we're celebrating this week, as well as the foundation laid by universal design. So first, intersectionality. Rather than focus on people with physical, sensory, or social disabilities alone, we consider the needs of a broader spectrum of the population based on the conviction that human experience and embodied identities are constituted by a, a variety of interconnected factors, and they include age, gender, race, uh, culture, religion, and ability. Uh, second, uh, we subscribe to a, a social model of disability. In other words, many approaches to accessibility, including the ADA, follow a medical model of disability based on the idea that design can compensate for impairments and allow people to lead normal lives. Mix subscribes to a social model of disability. Uh, what makes someone disabled is not their medical condition, but ableism, an ingrained, an ingrained societal, societal attitude or ideology that needs to be changed and whose ramifications lead to barriers that prevent people with disabilities from accessing the built environment. So also Mix offers an alternative to the ADA's focus on physical accommodations, uh, like separate ADA ramps and entrances, which are, are, which are great, but, but which potentially segregate and even stigmatize those with special needs. Our goal is to generate opportunities to allow differently embodied and differently identified people to mix in public space. Hence our name, Mix Design. We have developed a two-step inclusive design methodology and it's a work in progress. It's represented in this diagram. Uh, we hope its goal, or we hope we, our goal is to foster sharing among individuals, families, friends, cohorts, and caregivers. It's a two-step process. First, it begins with research and analysis. First, we analyze needs of, of a diverse list of end users. In this diagram, for example, restrooms, which we'll be talking about in this talk. Okay, these different users as they engage in four activities, grooming, washing, caregiving, and eliminating. And then second, we conduct a comparative analysis of the overlapping end user needs and activities. And the outcome is a shared matrix of shared design strategies that then guide material and finished choices, wayfinding, lighting, and the specification of furniture and fixtures. And so what I want to emphasize is that our goal is to enable the maximum number of differently embodied and identified people to interact in different settings while also providing options for people with unique functional or privacy needs. In other words, we recognize that there are no one size fits all solutions and that some people and some communities have unique needs that require unique spatial and design solutions. Um, next, we, uh, we look at this from a cultural cross-disciplinary perspective. Again, I'm generalizing. Most accessibility approaches like the ADA tend to focus on functional solutions shaped by quantitative criteria, seemingly objective data that is then transmitted through valuable design codes and building standards. In contrast, Mix believes that inclusive design is determined by both quantitative and qualitative factors shaped by a cross-disciplinary perspective that considers complex cultural, social, economic, and political forces. And finally, engagement. Mix believes that inclusive design depends on the active participation of stakeholders and end users who provide valuable insights from their lived experience of the design environment. And we try to draw from our transdisciplinary team of experts representing race, gender, and disability, as well as policy, law, and building code to conduct engagement practices. They would include surveys, interviews, workshops, and focus groups with the hope that we will yield and gather meaningful feedback that can be used and applied to generate innovative design concepts that empower users. 
Well, thank you very much, Joel, for uh, kind of outlining mixed designs uh, approach. Um, so our talk tonight is divided into two parts. Part one is going to illustrate how we are attempting to put those mixed principles that Joel just outlined into practice. Um, so I'm going to share with you this mixed initiative um, called Stalled, which some of you might be familiar with. Um, the project was founded in 2015 in response to American controversies over transgender access to public restrooms or the so-called transgender toilet wars. Stahl distinguished itself from the considerable body of work on trans access to restrooms generated by scholars, lawyers, and activists, and the media in a few ways. Um, most accounts do not cover this issue from an architectural perspective. Um, in contrast, we regard public restrooms as a social justice and public health issue that can be solved with innovative architectural solutions that do not take the norm of binary sex segregated restrooms as, as an inevitability. Um, and another thing I think that sets us apart is rather than considering this as a functional or technical issue alone, uh, we form a growing interdisciplinary team that represents experts from design, trans history, law, accessibility, and public health um, to take into account the complex cultural, political, and historical dimensions of this issue. And some of the people on the screen, this is just part of the, the, the constellation of people involved with Stalled. Um, but before coming up with design solutions for all gender restrooms, we realized that we needed to take a step back and look at the issue within its historical and cultural context to understand how we came to the crossroads where we are today. And restroom controversies, of course, are not new. Um, at different moments in American history, the public restroom registered social anxieties triggered by the threat of a series of marginalized groups entering into mainstream society. Um, one milestone included debate sparked by the introduction of the ladies' room as women began entering the workplace in the 1880s. Um, and the division of male and female bathrooms did not end here, of course. It rose its head again about a century later in the 1970s when the U.S. came close to ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment, um, which has been in the works for you know, over 100 years, um, which conservative opponents took as an opportunity to spread fears about men and women sharing restrooms as a way to shut down that progressive legislation. Another chapter in history was the fight to abolish colored bathrooms during the civil rights movement in the 50s and 60s. The fear of contamination posed by gay men sharing public lavatories with straight men during the AIDS crisis in the 1980s. And the pressure exerted by the disability rights movement, a coalition formed by grassroots activists that led to the passing of the American with Disabilities Act in 1990. Um, and Joel mentioned that uh, 30th anniversary um, we're celebrating this week of the ADA. But in each of these historical instances, the restroom, by virtue of being a physical space, transformed an abstract concern into a tangible peril. Um, and it became a space for nightmarish fantasies of so-called normal citizens um, being compelled to physically interact with others whose mere presence in that space was considered an affront or an abomination. Um, since 2013, of course, there have been a series on the federal and state level to deny trans folks access to the bathroom assigned to the gender with which we identify. Um, and this culminated with the Trump administration's undoing of many Obama era protections um, under Title IX. But a victory was won recently, um, just um, last month in June, when the Supreme Court ruled that LGBTQ plus people are protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, specifically in the workplace. Um, so this is a constantly evolving battle and you know, this is in the news every day. Um, so these previous slides tried to set up a framework of how we investigated restrooms through the lens of American politics. And I wanna emphasize um, that this is the lens of American politics and we have been investigating case studies of restroom conflicts around the world, um, but that is the perspective that we were coming from. Um, and that there are many complex factors that come in when we're talking about restrooms and sanitation infrastructures um, on global scales. But for the next step of our research, um, which set itself apart from the mainstream popular coverage of restroom battles, we looked through the lens of architectural history in order to really understand how we came to the physical space of the restroom that we all take for granted today, um, which is the sex segregated restroom where you have a male and a female restroom. A survey of the Western bathroom from antiquity to today challenges our preconceptions about the formal and ideological underpinnings of the ostensibly timeless typology illustrated on the right hand slide, side of the slide here. And while we take for granted that bathrooms combine in one space three activities, washing, grooming, and eliminating, 
History actually shows us that they were separated from one another until the advent of water delivery systems in the 19th century, which was um, illuminating for us. Um, because looking at restrooms through the lens of this history refuted the myth conveyed in architectural standards like the International Plumbing Code, as well as in Supreme Court legal battles, um, that bathrooms obey universal standards of privacy based on anatomical difference. So understanding that the male and female restrooms that um, folks consider so normal today is not actually inevitable, but is historically and culturally contingent, really liberated us to think outside the box and imagine alternatives. Um, and at this point, I'm gonna pass it back to Joel to share how we took that research and um, it allowed us to think outside of the, the box of that inevitability. Thank you, Seth. So over the past four or five years, SALT has developed inclusive restroom guidelines and prototypes that attempt to go further than the generally accepted code compliance solution for all gender restrooms. And that is what's referred to as the single user restroom. It supplements traditional sex segregated facilities by adding a single occupancy room, often with wheelchair access, with signage designating it as gender neutral or all gender or something to that effect. And look, this is a step in the right direction. However, we think we could do better. Why? Because it stigmatizes non-normative bodies, not only trans, but also disabled people, isolating them in one room and preventing them from mixing with others in public space. So instead, we favor the, well, the, the multi-user facility and we work closely with uh, Hansel Bauman and others at Gallaudet University, a school for the deaf in Washington, DC, to develop this prototype a multi-user solution that treats the restroom as a single open space with floor to ceiling partitions and communal areas for washing and grooming. And so here's a video uh, that shows the way we work with this retrofit. We begin by removing the existing plumbing stack and wall and treat the restroom as one single non-gendered open space. Then we eliminate the corridor wall and bathroom doors, making the bathroom a porous extension of the cor corridor. Next, we add two blocks of fully enclosed stalls of three sizes, standard, ambulatory, and EDA compliant, as well as caregiving rooms equipped with toilets, sink, and changing tables. And then we add communal grooming and washing areas, off the main circulation path. And finally, our scheme adds a lounge area that ac activates the corridor, we hope, into an animated open space. Okay, and again, as illustrated here, we think the solution is safer. Why? Because there are more occupants and more eyes, as Jane Jacobs would say, to, to monitor or watch the street. Non-binary folks don't have to make a, a choice that doesn't align with their identities, and we think it's generally more inclusive, embracing the needs of a wider segment of the population, and that we hope it also makes for kind of a spatially more exciting uh, architecture that enhances the needs of everyone. Uh, next. Also at Gallaudet, we developed and implemented a prototype for all gender changing rooms uh, that has uh, features also to meet di diverse users. Uh, they include, it includes seating for the elderly, baby changing tables, dry counters for medical procedures, and a small feature we're very proud of, a, a foot shower equipped for Muslims to perform bathroom evolutions. Uh, Stolz has also developed a prototype for high traffic spaces, like airports. Working with the slightly extended footprint that we got from studying sort of airport bathroom manuals, uh, uh, we reconceived of the sex segregated restroom as an open, agora-like precinct adjacent to the main concourse that is animated by three parallel activity zones dedicated respectively to grooming, washing, and eliminating. And supplementing traditional signage, multi, we began to think about something that's going to be very important to us later today. I'll talk about multi-sensory wayfinding. Now, differentiating the bathroom into three zones through the use of slip-resistant diamond plate, tile, and rubber that creates these uh, all, all coded blue. And why? Because we learned from the work done by Hansel Bauman uh, about deaf space that blue is a complementary background color for deaf signing because it contrasts with skin tones. Finally, the grooming, uh, second, the grooming station is immediately adjacent to the airport concourse. 
uh, a multi-level counter. It's placed against a mirrored wall, and it allows people of different heights and abilities to groom. And so we really wanted this reflection of all of these differently embodied people moving through the comp uh, complex to be part of the composition. Those who want privacy can retreat into curtained alcoves for breastfeeding, administering medical procedures like insulin or hormone injections, or they can engage in meditation and prayer, something our research says that many people do in restrooms. Uh, the next station, the communal washing station, meets the needs of adults, children, and people in wheelchairs, to name a few. Inset floor lights indicate the location of mo motion-activated faucets indicated into a wall that allows water to flow into an inclined splash plane placed at different ergonomic heights that is then collected and cleaned. A little background noise there. Uh, ergonomic heights that is then collected and cleaned in a remediating planter before being recycled. And finally, located at the back of the facility, the eliminating station consolidates rows of bathroom stalls that offer visual and acoustic privacy. Unoccupied stalls are indicated by recessed floor lights. When entered, they turn off, and, uh, and then now occupied stalls glow from within. And from inside each stall, users can surveil their surroundings by looking through a, a band of one-way uh, blue mirror located at eye level. Uh, also, stall this facility would contain low flush composting toilets that treat human waste through aerobic composition. So our hope was that as users circulate from one station to the next, passing from the outermost grooming station to the innermost toilet wall, they experience a multi-sensory gradient that takes them from, from public to private, from open to closed, from smooth to coarse, from dry to wet, acoustically reverberant to sound absorptive, from ambient to spot lighting. Now I'll pass it back to Seb. Um, yeah, thank you, Joel. So I think as um, Rosalie was kind of alluding to earlier, you know, we weren't satisfied with just um, coming up with designs, um, although visualizing those prototypes really did uh, help win some folks over and um, get some imaginations flowing, but we realized that there was uh, more to be done. So over the past two years, We've joined forces with faculty and graduate students at Yale's School of Public Health to bring an added dimension um, to the stalled work. Um, we already know from what we were sharing earlier that equal access to restrooms is a civil right, um, but at the same time, evidence-based data shows that the design environment does have a direct and tangible impact on physical and mental health. Um, so we've been working with Antonia Caba, an amazing um, now graduated um, graduate student from Yale Public Health, who conducted an IRB approved survey with 120 um, people and 82 interviews with both gender minorities and cisgender students uh, sampled from universities across the country. Um, and then she found these two findings on the right, um, that inequitable bathroom access does contribute to mental health disparities between gender minority and cisgender individuals. Um, you can probably guess uh, which direction those disparities lean. Um, and also that both cisgender and gender minority participants preferred all gender restrooms, both single and multi-user over the existing um, uh, kind of sex segregated male female restrooms, which was actually um, something we didn't expect to find, but we're pleased to hear. Um, in addition, Antonia, from the public health perspective, expanded our purview to investigate a broader spectrum of end users. Um, you can kind of see these end users on the left hand side, um, but these include people who menstruate, including trans men, people with autism, people with pyuresis or shy bladder syndrome who fear urinating in public, um, people who are incontinent, people who breastfeed, um, and so many different folks where um, the existing restroom solutions just aren't working. Um, and we're excited to publish these findings in a stalled book um, that we're currently working on. Um, and I think the public health angle was one thing, but we also realized that even that was not enough and um, that making our prototype uh, of the multi-user desegregated solution viable meant actually amending uh, the international plumbing code. Um, so you can see that on the right hand side that this is the model code that governs most construction in the United States and is updated about uh, every three years. And we joined forces with the AIA and the National Center for Transgender Equality. Um, and we're actually successful in lobbying this. Um, so the 2021 version of the code will make all gender multi-user restrooms um, code compliant, um, liberating architects and clients to um, put forth um, these kind of 
um, restrooms like the ones we showed previously. So um, that's to say that gender fluidity yields spatial fluidity, um, opening up new formal and material possibilities for the design of equitable public space. And now that this code has changed, I think um, architects will be able and clients will be able to work together to come up with um, better ideas together. Um, and these are some 360 renderings from the airport prototype, um, which you can see if you want in VR um, on the Mixed Design website. Um, and finally, moving a little bit beyond restrooms, just to say that mixed design is uh, thinking about other building types as well. We've been working with Yale University students, faculty, clinicians from Yale Public Health and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia um, to develop recommendations for art museums, hospitals, and university campuses. Um, and you can learn a bit more about this on the website. But on the left is um, some work we've been doing with Queens Museum um, and on the right with Yale University Art Gallery. So transitioning to um, the second part of our presentation, kind of the post-COVID um, part, um, we'll share how mixed design is exploring the inevitable impact that the coronavirus pandemic is having on public buildings um, and the design of the built environment. So looking at the spatial implications of COVID is a natural extension of mixed design's mission to make public sa spaces safe and accessible to all people, regardless of age, racial, cultural identity, gender, religion, and ability, in ways that explore social equity, health, and well-being. Um, and this uh, is, a, is a really nice um, feature that the, the New York Times Magazine did on mixed design, which I encourage folks to check out if they haven't. Um, uh, it, it got some great um, commentary from many of our collaborators and kind of showed the, the wide range of folks we work with, including Rosalie. Um, so thinking about the kind of long-term view that we're trying to take here, um, and this slide kind of illustrates the quick temporary solutions, at least to COVID and restrooms. And we recognize that these um, quick fixes are important and necessary, um, but we're stepping a little bit back in the way that we did with Stall, then trying to, rather than frame the pandemic as just a public health issue with um, objective functional parameters that can be solved um, with interim solutions like this, um, I think this is a moment where we can step back look at the spatial consequences of the pandemic within a larger cultural and historical context and really make sure that we prioritize the needs of marginalized and vulnerable populations um, who are often left out of the conversation, especially with the kind of urgency that the pandemic brings. And we must be vigilant and not repeat the past historical mistakes um, around public health um, because over the course of American history, public health fears were used to justify the oppression and spatial segregation of what we call non-compliant bodies, including African-Americans, queer and trans people, and people with disabilities. Um, Samuel Kelton Roberts, a professor at Columbia University, focuses on the intersection of history, public health, and race. Um, and his book shown here on the left, Infectious Fear, shows how theories of scientific racism, racial hygiene, and social Darwinism did contribute to Jim Crow era policies that perpetuated the segregation of black citizens, illustrated here with separate drinking fountains and lunch counters. And we call attention to this to show that public health and inclusive design must not become an either or proposition, but a both and opportunity. Um, COVID could be a serious setback for inclusive design if commercial government and institutional clients decide to reallocate resources from inclusive design projects uh, to come up with solutions that meet the needs of the mainstream, but not um, marginalized populations. So we really need to ensure that um, funds continue to be invested in post-pandemic spaces that meet the needs of all bodies, um, not just the normal ones. Um, so our initiative is collaborating with a team of experts, which includes clinicians from Yale Public Health, a Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as mentioned, and Thomas Jefferson University Hospital to generate space planning principles that address one of the fundamental challenges posed by COVID balancing the need for individuals to engage with one another and with the built environment while considering the public health imperative to restrict individuals from having contact with others, social distancing, and from touching contaminating surfaces of the built environment. And addressing touch is relatively straightforward. Um, we're researching and developing a catalog of materials, finishes, and fixtures, and equipment to allow people to have safe contact with the built environment, including touch-free fixtures and equipment, like sanitizing stations, ID readers, and toilet room fixtures, as well as antimicrobial and easy to disinfect wall finishes, upholstery, and furniture. But the greater challenge is space planning for social distancing. 
which involves studying proxemics, which is the dynamics of human occupation and socialization for bodies both in motion, um, circulating from one place to another, and at rest, occupying one place to perform programmed um, and unscripted activities. Um, and this is governed by dynamic interrelated variables that are both quantitative and qualitative. Um, and LTL Architects um, is creating these stunning drawings by, um, that visualize the metrics developed by epidemiologists that factor into account density, uh, number of people in an area, volume of an enclosed space, viral exposure time, airflow, and the time of day and season um, to provide guidelines on COVID mitigation. And Mark Saramaki, um, who worked on this report, will be uh, moderating the panel um, tomorrow with the league. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Joel. Thanks, Seb. And I might point out that if time permits, Mark might uh, be generous enough to share some of this work, very valuable work that he and LTL are doing. So uh, to pick up, so Mix is trying to complement this work, this very, very valuable uh, work by approaching the same problem of COVID mit mitigation from a qualitative perspective, considering the ways in which what we call environmental stressors impact behavior in social settings that pose unintentional, unintentional risks of infection. In a nutshell, we believe for people to feel safe but connected, they need public spaces designed to minimize in environmental stressors induced by one, disorientation, confusing faces that lead to unintended contacts with people or building surfaces, equipment, and fixtures. And two, overstimulation, anxieties triggered by noise, lights, crowds, et cetera. We believe that reducing environmental stressors depends on spatial awareness, sensory cues that make people aware of the presence of the presence and activities others of others, especially in unfamiliar public spaces. And so Mix regards COVID mitigation design as an inherently dynamic socio-spatial concern of architecture that considers bodies, again, both at motion as well as at rest. I think studies now tend to talk about, you know, those fixed decals, where to stand, we move as well as are at rest. And we also are swayed by sensory perceptions, social and cultural codes of conduct that regulate human behavior and interaction. And so now, with the spread of the with the spread of COVID-19, all of us to varying degrees have become to some extent non-compliant bodies. Why? Because we're hyper aware and often anxious about how to maneuver safely within once familiar but now disabling spaces. In other words, we can experience what so many marginalized folks have been feeling for years. We, but so we believe we can learn from those who for so long have navigated spaces unfit for their unique ways of being. And this question is the research question that informs our current work. So it's kind of a work in progress, but I just want to share it with you. And so to that end, this is what we're trying to do. We're drawing from the expertise of mixed design team members to learn about sensory cues that combat environmental stressors by studying three marginalized communities, people in wheelchairs, the deaf, and people on the autism spectrum, who each in their own ways, we think, have developed novel behavioral and design strategies for addressing social distancing to fit the unique needs that we conjecture can be applied to the general public. So, MIX member Kumela Royo, former disability specialist at the New York Department of Transportation. You'll meet him tomorrow at our workshop. His, he is drawn from his own experience, offering advice on the needs of people with mobility issues, including users of wheelchairs, walkers, and canes, who require, in a nutshell, unobstructed paths of travel that allow them to maneuver with hitting, without hitting people or walls. Well, we all need that in COVID-19. Uh, he recommends paths of travel, ideally wide enough for pairs of wheelchair users to pass one another in two directions without bumps, uh, and also to, over, uh, to, to avoid abrupt level changes. He suggests avoiding deep carpets and rough surfaces that collect dirt uh, and impede movement. In addition, he's come up with a whole series of ways of making entryways and surfaces more sanitary for people who use assistive devices that I'm going to talk about a little later and he'll talk more about tomorrow. 
Um, we've also learned from the work of mixed team member Hansel Bauman, who established Deaf Space, the Deaf Space Project at Gallaudet University in 2006 to explore architecture and its role in the deaf experience. In a nutshell, I'm compressing a lot. Deaf people communicate visually using signed languages and perceive space primarily through vision and touch, a fact really considered in building design. Conversation between two people, particularly while walking, can be especially challenging. Uh, users of American Sign Language rely on vision to simultaneously see where they're going, uh, but see who they're talking to, their companion signing. This requires multi-sensory awareness. Again, reducing physical bar barriers to do what? To establish clear sight lines, maintain proper visual conditions, glare-free lighting, color contrasts to reduce eye strain, and allow face-to-face -face views among participants while at motion and at rest. We're also collaborating with another mixed member who you'll meet tomorrow, Magna Mustafa. She's an autism expert based in Cairo who authored the Autism Aspects Design Index. Again, autism refers to a broad range of communication, social, and behavioral conditions. There are many ways of being autistic, uh, they, but it includes a sensitivity to sensory overstimulation and distraction triggered by crowds, large active open spaces, loud noise, and bright lights. And to avoid these conditions, Mostava recommends sequencing spaces in a predictable way that flows from one activity to the next. We could learn from that. Grouping functions into high stimulus versus low stimulus zones with what's critical spaces of transition allowing time and space to, recal to recalibrate between different experiences. Compartmentalizations, uh, that is her word for this, uh, areas designed to focus on specific tasks, and uh, escape spaces, places where environmental conditions can be customized for their sensory input. And finally, reducing environmental stress by modulating acoustics to, minimate, to minimize background noise and reverberation, to control light levels, color, and glare. And so we're in the process, and I really want to emphasize it's a conjectural hypothetical work in progress, but we're in the process of applying these insights to a case study, a comparative analysis of public building entry sequences for three building types. We're looking at residential buildings, museums, hospitals, and campuses. That's actually four building types. Okay, as this diagram illustrates, again, it's that two-step process. First, we compare the affinities and differences of our three end user groups depicted here. Uh, the deaf, people on the spectrum, people with mobility issues, as they perform these typical activities that happen uh, in entry sequences. Circulation, welcome, um, and et cetera. And as this diagram illustrates, it's a two-step process. First, we compare the affinities and differences of our three end user groups as they conduct four entry sequences, activities like circulation, welcome, lounge, and clean. And this ana analysis forms the basis of brainstorming design interventions that form the basis of our work. So this matrix compares the affinities and potential conflicts between design principles derived from mobility, autism, aspects, and deaf space design guidelines. We don't have time to dig through it, but the kind of darker dots um, reflect direct affinities between groups. Uh, for example, all three communities, we learn benefit from barrier-free predictable paths of travel with clear sight lines and transition zones. The deaf and autistic also favor clearly demarcated sensory activity zones with glare-free lighting and acoustics that reduce noise. Okay? However, there are also conflicts. For example, deaf and autistic users uh, uh, favor compartmentalized spaces for a single focused activity, while others, people with mobility issues and deaf users need more open spaces, multi-purpose spaces. So our objective moving forward is to apply these lessons learned from this comparative analysis to generate inclusive COVID design, design, design principles that not only meet the needs of these three communities, but we hope also can impact the general public. And why based on what we believe is a common denominator, that all of us require sensory cues in the time of COVID that increases our spatial awareness, right? And how to capitalize on these insights is what we're thinking about. 
So I'm, very, I'm going to just finish up this presentation by showing you one study. We're in the process of applying these insights to a case study, a comparative analysis of public building entry sequences uh, for these, for, for in this case, uh, a campus entry sequence. And this is a residential college and it illustrates our thinking. It's based on, again, what we're calling multi-sensory wayfinding. It augments conventional signage and uses color, materials, lighting, and acoustics to differentiate two kinds of legible activity zones, barrier-free circulation paths and what we refer to as media microclimates, spaces that balance social distancing and human connectivity in a way that minimizes environmental stressors and increases spatial awareness for everyone. So let me quickly walk you through the scheme. In the vestibule, uh, visitors can clean at hand sanitizing stations before entering the building. A central planter and separate entry and exit circulation aisles prevent unwanted collisions. The transition threshold, threshold demarcates that intersection where circulation paths cross to allow all occupants of all abilities, including the autistic people in wheelchairs and the deaf, to slow down, to acclimate, to change direction without bumping into other people. So both function as sensory transition areas with calming effects that we think can benefit everyone. And also we feel that these spaces, again, need to be glare free, have sound absorbing acoustic finishes that again, allow everyone to sort of reacclimate as they move from a kind of more outdoor environment to an indoor one. Um, here is a view of what we call the wellness hub. Visitors obtain multilingual information and an accessible reception desk designed to allow both front and side approaches for wheelchair users. It features a multi-level transaction counter at different heights that's deep enough to provide enough leg room, leg room for wheelchair users while also ensuring social distancing between visitors and receptionists. Visitors can obtain multilingual information framed by the backdrop of an electronic message board that includes American Sign Language for deaf sign, sign, signers and PECs and other forms of visual lang language used by the autistic community, community. And so the Wellness Hub no longer hidden down a corridor like most restrooms. It is the first thing you see behind reception. Uh, we've introduced an expanded version of our stalled restroom conceived of as a porous extension of now the main entrance. It includes privacy stalls, hand-free communal sinks and toilets activated by motion. In addition, it possesses a series of limited user spacers for caregiving, breastfeeding, and prayer. It also serves uh, people with autism, escape spaces used for calming and flexibility. Social distancing, uh, we're thinking could be introduced by something you already see, floor markers, as well as color co contrasting lockers and stall doors that allow visitors through pattern integrated into the built environment to practice social distancing uh, uh, just through color. Uh, the scheme also would include um, installed doors with indicator locks that indicate the presence of others, a design feature barred from deaf space guidelines. And finally, let me walk you next uh, through a parallel section. Uh, Seb, next. Uh, this is a parallel section cut through the study lounge of this campus sequence, also subdivided into differentiated multisensory zones that balance the potential conflict between deaf and autistic users. It provides both a calm zone on the left with semi-enclosed with semi compartmentalized gathering spaces for everyone, but particularly for autistic users, as well as on the right, uh, this more open space uh, that, for, that gives all of us, but especially deaf users, that sense of openness and spatial connection that they need. And so next, the calm zone features a series of semi-enclosed nooks for solitude and small group conversations. It has adjustable low-level lighting, acoustical treatment to, limited, to limit unwanted stimulation, for those on the spectrum, and high back seating, as, uh, uh, which produces a visually calm uh, off-white background for color contrasting for American Sign Language. And uh, again, to complement a full range of skin tones. And applying lessons learned from autistic and deaf users, we hope, for example, in these alcoves would be good for most everyone who needs focused visual and auditory communications while in a safe and 
comfortable social distancing environment. And, and finally here, the indoor-outdoor transition zone. Next. Uh, uh, it, we, again, we think of it as a kind of medium microclimate. It's defined by sound absorbing oval carpets and suspended cones that absorb sound and emit intimate pools of glare free light. These islands allow for individual or group interactions of different densities, including individuals and small groups engaging with phones and laptops. And again, multi height mobile modular seating, a recommendation of desk space, can be reconfigured to accommodate social distancing and make sure everybody can see each other, including deaf signers in public space. And uh, like the comm zone, we think this transition space also needs to have access to the outdoor environment, the surrounding landscape to optimize natural views and control light, to make sure that these light conditions are diffuse, even without glare, to eliminate hot spots, high contrast background for that, that is essential to deaf signing and what autistic users need. So to conclude, uh, we hope this, this campus entry sequence, it's a work in progress. We see it as a case study to test the viability of our working hypothesis based on two premises. First, Seb already said this, I'll repeat it. Public health and inclusive design are not either or propositions. Moving forward, clients need to invest in post pandemic spaces that meet the needs of all bodies, not just the ones that society considers normal. Equal access to public space is a civil right that has a direct and tangible impact on mental and physical health, especially for vulnerable populations. But designing through the lens of non-compliant bodies, we believe promises to be a catalyst for creativity. By applying lessons learned from non-compliant bodies, in this case, people with various sensory sensitivities, we believe can lead to innovative uh, design innovations that can ultimately yield inclusive and hygienic healthy spaces for all of us. As Magda Mustafa says, when you design for the extreme, we all benefit. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm gonna stop screen sharing now. Great. That was, Totally fascinating and a, a huge amount to take in. Um, we have a bunch of questions and I have some questions too. So I think what I'd like to do is actually um, go with some very specific questions first and then move to some more general ones. Um, one person asked about the, um, the airport, I think, um, bathroom, what's the use of the eye level one way mirror? Um, that it seems interesting, but what does it do? Do you want to answer that, Seb? Sure. Um, we had the eye level one way mirror, which actually looking at that prototype now, I want to redo the drawing to have it at many different eye levels because there are many different eye levels. Um, but it allows you to kind of monitor your surroundings so you know um, if someone's approaching you, if someone's right in front of your stall, if you're about to open the door. Um, and just give you a little more comfort because sometimes with the big cracks you see in American style stalls, you can kind of know what's going on around you by looking at people's feet. But if it was a full floor to ceiling, um, I think it would provide you a little more, uh, a little more uh, security to know. And I don't know, I, I can't speak on Joel's behalf, but he's, uh, his, his design history is interested kind of in, uh, in yeah, the, yeah, the queer optics of looking through transparent surfaces. And I think it's a fun provocation. Um, and then a uh, second one, um, how can the collective grooming station best serve a post-COVID era? Um, and how uh, this maybe you showed, um, but how can it take care of individual needs for privacy? But I guess the, the first part of the question about the um, seeming close adjacencies of people in the collective grooming area. Yeah, well, that, that's a very, uh, 
whoever asked that question is looking very closely, or maybe that's you, but that's pre-COVID, okay? When we wanted the maximum density of bodies, of non-compliant bodies, we were reveling in this image of reflection that's not captured in that rendering. But of course, if you look at the updated wellness station, it's very specific. It has markers that, again, have floor patterns um, that let you always have the option of, of social distancing. And that would occur not only between stalls, like for example, again, we haven't worked it out, but I mean, we're, we're thinking again, is this gonna be here to stay and we don't wanna mandate necessarily? So for example, if like, if you had a, a, a blue door, three white doors and a blue doors, with, right? That could indicate to people if they wanted to be six feet apart that they could. Same thing we're, we're recommending at the sinks and, and, other, and other stations. But again, these are just ideas, okay? And uh, that, mm -hmm. that but, but I do think that one of the issues is how do you give people options without dictating, okay? Because like, for example, if you're going to the bathroom with your partner, you might wanna, and you practice, you're part of a pod, you can be next to each other in stalls, right? Otherwise you might wanna keep your distance. So I think that's a, I don't think we've solved it, but it's, I'm really glad you asked that question and it's, it's something that we need to think about. There are a couple of questions about um, how these kinds of strategies can be applied to um, one to public open spaces like squares and parks and streets and then um, another question from somebody else about public restrooms in public parks. Mm. You um, we have thought about public restrooms and parks in the past for stalled and kind of as they're called comfort stations and um, and applying the stalled methodology of um, non-binary restrooms and parks. But in terms of larger scale thinking in terms of post-pandemic design, I would say that our focus um, on building typologies has been on the types that we listed, um, hospitals, clinics, university campuses, um, et cetera. Um, so I think while our firm has a long history of thinking about the relationship of indoor versus outdoor. Um, I don't think we've considered the larger scale of parks yet in our approach. And I just want to add that, that one, Kumel Arroyo, the former um, disability specialist at the DOT, who actually did commission us to come up with a prototype, which we did, for uh, a, a, a public restroom model for New York. Uh, um, he, he has many, many ideas. He's been thinking about this for years, but as Seb said, that's outside of our wheelhouse. And also Lewis or Maki Lewis in their guide, they, they, they make recommendations. So I, so many people are thinking about this and I would just say this, and this is a, um, a funny thing to say, but as a New York architect, okay, who just hung out his shingle, I didn't even realize Rosalie, you should have told me, okay, when we first met, if you want to be an architect, you know, you move out of New York, okay, because the commission should get our interiors, but, but I kind of try to make the most of that, and I've become, in the course of my career, very interested at that scale of body architecture, so I would say that we're kind of doing, working within our um, area of expertise, which begins on the inside and moves outside. Other people out there, including many in this audience, are doing important work at a bigger scale. We want to collaborate with you, so give us a call and we'll work together. Um, actually, I'm going to throw in one of my own um, questions here, and we'll come back to some of the other ones. But how, um, how has this work changed the way that you do the work um, when somebody comes to you for a house commission, for example, how would you say that your design process has changed? And just to make the question even more impossible, you, you Joel, have been a teacher pretty much your entire career. So what, is, what um, kinds of ideas has this work planted in your mind about how design education should change? Okay, so I'm going to avoid the first question because I'm inevitably going to say the wrong answer. But I would just say this, that, that I let other more patient people in my office really handhold with our residential clients. And I have shifted uh, and really have been focusing a lot more on this work. Okay, I, I think that happens as you get older. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, uh, so that, that's the answer to the first question. But um, uh, don't get me wrong, we still value residential work. Um, but in terms of design education, that's a huge question. And all of this has to begin with design education. I feel that so much of what I'm trying to do um, 
but I'm going to say this again. I feel like an imposter, okay? I came to this as someone who had a very traditional education in the, in the 1980s, right? Where the default user of architecture, we never even talked about this, right? Diversity and inclusion, we, we, we never even represented bodies, right? But that body was that default user. So I think it's so ingrained, not only in the popular imagination, but in design education. And what we need to do moving forward is redesign curriculums entirely, I would say, so that it's not just one marginalized co course on inclusive design, but it should be uh, a, a kind of a criteria, a way of thinking in our D DNA from in every course that we teach, from studio to, 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 to you know, technical courses. And secondly, I think it, we need a bigger change, okay, which is breaking down the boundaries between design education which also mirrors uh, protocols of professional practice, which silos us as landscape architects, architects, interiors, and don't get me started, that is hierarchical and you know, we're, we're architects are on top. And unless we be, you know, and I think that's changing, but I think the key is holistic thinking that analyzes and then comes up with design opportunities that look holistically across scales, right? and see graphic design, wayfinding, furniture design, interiors, fabrics, furniture, interior, you know, you know what I'm saying, wall finishes, buildings, landscape. It's one continuum that at different scales has to serve different kinds of non-compliant bodies. And I think unless we have that sensibility in the future, we're doomed. Um, um, yeah, I would chime in even though that question wasn't meant for me, just that um, I, I re really appreciate Joel's approach to design pedagogy and architecture, but also, you know, listen to the students. The students have been advocating for these things for decades and oftentimes are coming in um, with more knowledge about this than the professors, so. Which is why Seb is the co-director of Mixed Design. <laughs> no, it's absolutely true. Um, uh, you know, no, we inevitably, you know, come to our work shaped by our own histories. Right, right. And I think I'm trying to overcome my history. And I rely on people like Seb because they bring a fresh eye to this and new perspectives. And they're right. It's the younger generation that knows what they need to do in the future. So I'm going to uh, kind of give you two questions here, the two of you. Um, one is, how do you bridge the communication gap between disciplines like design that are more apt to um, to accept qualitative data as credible and those like medicine, which are more likely to um, depend on quantitative data. Um, and then there are a couple of, and I see these as, per, as related, um, maybe others don't, but um, a couple of questions about code compliance and how, and the need for codes to change in ways that would allow you to do the kind of work that you're proposing. Okay, so do you want to begin? Well, sure, um, I would say that's a extremely huge question and one we've had to come up with against so much doing our work as mixed design, especially with restrooms where people want to see the data, they want to see the metrics on whether um, this is going to decrease wait times, will it make the restroom cheaper to have it be all gender? And I think that's what inspired a lot of our collaborations with public health to kind of bring in this more quantitative side to the work of inclusive design. But we also don't want to fall into the pitfalls or traps of metrics and metric driven design. Um, you know, there are whole fields of evidence based design and um, designing for healthcare buildings and hospitals and clinics, which is great, but I think they really need to be balanced um, with the kind of quantitative experience or else you end up losing um, a lot of the, the diversity and multiplicity of identities, which makes architecture um, beautiful. And why things like the ADA, while great, can sometimes be flattening um, when they kind of prescribe these guidelines, but then you kind of are locked into this, um, I don't know, metric driven approach um, that doesn't allow for a difference. Yeah, and, and the other thing I just add uh, to what, what Seb said uh, is that, this is going to be actually one of the main questions that we hope we're going to talk about tomorrow. This challenge, because I'm a cross disciplinarity, how do that's one of the things we have. D different disciplines speak different languages, and we're struggling actually to marry those. 
And not only that, as Rosalie, you know firsthand, as we apply for grants, like there are design grants, everything's siloed, right? But when we apply to the National Health Fund, the Science Foundation, which we're trying to do, they're like, what? What is this, right? And we've encountered that a lot. So it's about challenging those disciplinary preconceptions. But I would say this, that contrary to my preconception, okay, when it was Deborah Burke, my dean, who said, I think you should collaborate with Yale Public Health. And I went kicking and screaming because I thought I, you know, I can't even balance a checkbook, let alone deal with metrics. And, but it was, it's that contingency, right? that are more interested, I think, in this work or earlier that we're doing now than architects, okay? They have been thinking about the impact of the built environment on public health for a long time. I would say that they need the um, collaborative assistance of architects with a different level of expertise to sort of round that out. And that's what we're trying to do. But you, that's the first thing. You gotta, you can't pigeonhole what you think you're, collaborator from another discipline is going to be, be like, they're different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, how, um, how do you convince clients? I mean, so far, your, how do you convince clients to, um, take on the challenge of implementing the kinds of things that you're proposing. Um, so far, your, your clients, how have your clients come to you, I guess, is part of the question, um, who, for this kind of work? Or have you gone to the, have you sought out the clients? I'll let Seb answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um both for sure probably more the latter you know we've been spending years you know calling folks up and having meetings convincing folks that this is an issue that needs to be taken seriously and a lot of it was um sharing our research with them to understand that like there is a problem one and two something has to be done with it i think now things are starting to change a little bit and i think that's kind of a special opportunity presented by covid where um, clients and decision makers and stakeholders are saying we need to do something about our spaces and make sure it works for everyone and I think there's kind of a strategic moment now for us to go in there and say okay do you really mean for everyone um, so I think um, it's building consensus by going to them but I think when people come to us um, sometimes they have a hazy notion of we want to have a diversity and inclusion angle but they don't really know what um, and then I think the convincing process is a very uh, complex one that I think Joel could speak better to working, you know, with different clients over the decades. But also, you know, I just add to it, what Seb is saying by saying that I, I sometimes I make a bad analogy that saying is I think it, that, that inclusive design is kind of in its infancy and, and maybe what uh, green design or sustainability was maybe 20 years ago, right, or 15 years ago. Right? At a time, people said, why should I spend more money on this? What do I need this? What are you talking about? And now it's absolutely right, embedded in, 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 in not only our practices, but in our progressive clients' benchmarks of how they want to work. It's uh, ingrained. And I'd like to think that what we're doing now is, you know, if we have this panel or, you know, talk, I hope, you know, invite it back, it'll change, you know, five years from now. But I have to say, at the beginning, it was a grueling, horrible, uphill battle. Uh, and if it weren't for Seb, it never would have happened. And if it weren't for Rosalie, it never would have happened. And I'm serious, because my cup is always half empty. It's so depressing, knocking on people's door, asking them to think about something they never even cared about, that it was only going to be more time, more schedule, more trouble. Okay. And I think that the, the, the shift right was restrooms when it, it happened internally or every, so many universities had a problem and they suddenly came to us so we've done a lot of workshops and, and 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 a lot of clients have come to us that way but i would say just when i was about to give up okay something changed and i think it's part of this amazing time that we're living in okay where you know as you know right crises like the pandemic, Black Lives Matter, social justice. People, I think, are finally getting it. And I really feels for a minute 
that after climbing the walls and, 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 and having calls with you, Rosalie, complaining and you saying, Joel, don't give up. Now people are starting to call us. And I don't want to talk about it, but and we just for the first time you know, landed an incredibly wonderful job. And I like to think that why we got the job was because we offered that extra added dimension to our work, which our client really, really cares about. I want to um, end up on a kind of philosophical question um, that is about language, um, and it's um, an additional. It's three terms that um, came up in your talk that I just wonder what um, the two of you um, kind of your meditation on how these terms might be used into the future or what their significance is now. Um, one is your term of non-compliant bodies, and another is the idea of disability, both of which, you know, implicit in them is the idea of a norm that you're diverging from. So are those, and then the other term, which I, um, I noticed during the talk is post-COVID. Um, and there, you know, maybe the implications of the three of them are each a bit different from the other. But I wonder if you would um, talk for a minute about both maybe the power of language, the meaning of these particular terms, and how you expect, how you think they frame our understandings of things, and how you think they might change into the future. I'm going to let Seb answer that question, but <laughs> vocabulary is so important. And as I even said the word, I don't know how to say it post-COVID. We don't have crystal ball. There isn't going to be a post-COVID. We believe these, these things are here to stay. We don't know to what degree. I just don't know what to say. So thanks for picking on that. <laughs> yeah, thank, thank you. Sorry. Thank you for picking on that as the last question. <laughs> Dad, why don't you talk about the rest? Um, I would say for non-compliant bodies that originated from the idea of code compliance when it came to restrooms um, and um, all gender multi-user restrooms not being compliant, not complying with the international plumbing code. Um, so that's kind of the origin of that term. But I, I still kind of like it because rather than saying it's the body that is there's something wrong with it, it's it's kind of pointing to the code or the the kind of built environment that's what's wrong. It's like it. I think of non-compliant kind of like insurgent or something. It's like rebellious. It's like I'm not going to comply with your regulation that tells me I can't be here. Um, so that's kind of how I see that term. Um, but I understand that it could be perceived in many ways. Um, for disability and ability, I think we tried to queer that a little bit in our presentation. I know on multiple slides, sometimes we say people of all abilities, sometimes we say people with disabilities. And I think here, um, we always defer to, um, you know, disability justice workers, advocates, and that community itself. Um, and from what we know, and the disability justice advocates we've spoken to, that, um, that disability is um, a term that's been championed by these activists. Um, but of course, um, folks with disabilities are not a monolith. Um, and some people might prefer other terminology. Um, and then I think maybe it's our responsibility to mix it up and acknowledge the power dynamics of language there. Um, Post-COVID, post-pandemic spaces, mm. I don't know. I feel, I feel like post-pandemic I see as just like a, a hashtag that's popping up now and maybe we've just not done enough critical work to think about better language. Yeah, no, no good answer for that one. Thank you so much to the two of you. You're doing such important and fascinating work. And it's, um, I'm really looking forward to continuing the conversation tomorrow. So everybody um, who's um, in the audience and listening, um, please do join us tomorrow at one. I also want to put in um, a plug for Architectural League membership, um, which League members provide a very important source of support for all of our programs. Um, obviously, at the moment, the relationship of our members to our programs is a bit different than in other times because you don't get free admission to a, um, to a physical event. Um, nonetheless, we depend tremendously on our members and we hope um, that our members believe that we're doing important work in offering programs like this. So. If you are not a member, please go to our website and um, 
check out membership. We would love to have you join us. And um, for everyone, please join us tomorrow at one o'clock. And thank you, Seb and Joel, so much for a really fascinating, great program. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for inviting thank us. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.